Go ahead, continue. They were sent on their journey by the church and passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, telling of the conversion of the Gentiles, and <coughs> brought great joy to all the brothers. When they arrived in, in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, as well as by the apostles and the presbyters, and they reported what God had done with them. But some from the party of the Pharisees, who had become believers, stood up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and direct them to observe the Mosaic Law. Okay, this is the issue out there now. Paul and Barnabas were now teaching that everyone can be members of God's family. Remember, they're going out to the Gentiles. Everyone now has the opportunity of salvation. And what they ran into, there's some people out there preaching something contrary. And they're preaching that you first have to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. So that's the issue out there. There was conflict in that early church. Paul was teaching this. Other people were teaching this. There was dissension out there. So go ahead with verse 6. Let's see what happened. The apostles and the presbyters met together to see about this matter. So now who? Now Paul and Barnabas came back to Jerusalem. Did you get this? They came back to Jerusalem and they brought the, the issue back. And now it says the apostles and the presbyters met to see about this matter. So now the apostles and all the ordained people in the church are getting together. And they're going to meet about it. Okay, go ahead. After much debate had taken place, Peter got up and said to them, My brothers, you are all well aware that from early days God made his choice among you, that through my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now, all the apostles got together with all the other ordained leaders, and who, stay, who stands up? Peter. Why do you think Peter stands up? He has all these ordained people there. Why do you think it's Peter that got up? Got He's the CEO. He's the CEO. I like that. Got He's the guy. So he stands up. All right? And God, who knows the heart, bore witness by granting them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. He made no distinction between us and them. <coughs> but by faith he purified their hearts. Why then are you now putting God to the test by placing on his shoulder, on the shoulders of the disciples, a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, contrary, we believe that what we that we are saved through the grace of of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. So Peter now is giving them a speech on the basics of the faith. He's saying this is the faith. You know, to the group of people. Now let's just, to save a little bit of time, let's just go over to verse 22 and continue the story. So Peter now tells them, you know, this is what we believe, this is why. Because he can do it verse 22. Then the apostle, apostles and presbyters, in agreement with the whole church, decided to choose representatives and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. The ones chosen were Judas, who was called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers. This is the letter delivered by them, the apostles and the presbyters, your brothers, to make the brothers of Antioch, Syria, and whatever, of Gentile origin, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number who went out without any mandate from us have upset you with their teachings and disturbed your peace of mind, we have, with one accord, decided to choose representatives and to send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul who have dedicated their lives to the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we are sending Judas and Silas, who will also convey this same message by word of mouth. It is a decision of the Holy Spirit and of us not to place on you any burden beyond these necessities. Okay, let's stop right here. Verse 28, really the punchline of all this. It is the decision of whom? The Holy Spirit and of us. Not to place any burdens, meaning you don't have to become a Jew first. So put in perspective, Paul is out there, runs into dissension. He comes back to Jerusalem. All the apostles and ordained people gather together. Peter stands up and addresses the group. This is what we believe. And then they discuss it. And then they come to a decision. And it says now, it is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us not to place any burden. In other words, Peter now is declaring, we've talked about it with the guidance of the Holy Spirit because of the authority that we have, 
we make the decision. And at this point in time, they make the decision, you do not have to be a Jew first before you have to be a Christian. And now they're telling Paul to go out and preach this. <laughs> and for those who have, an, I know, a New Jerusalem Bible, there's a heading. In the very beginning of chapter 15, what do you have in bold print? It's called yeah. council. the Council of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. A council. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. In the Catholic Church, we have something called a ecumenical council. And you know what that is? An ecumenical council is when the Catholic Church gathers all the bishops together under the leadership of the Pope to discuss matters, to make a decision which becomes binding upon the church. That's exactly what they did in Acts chapter 15. So where do you think the Catholic Church got the idea of all the ordained bishops gathering together under the leadership of the Pope to make decisions about faith and morals that are binding upon the church? Where do you think we got it? Acts 15. Right in the Bible. How much more biblical can this be? And this is why the councils. Does everyone know what ecumenical council is? It's what the church did throughout history. Whenever there was a problem in the church, when there was some dissension, some confusion, they got together to formally resolve matters so that the truth is known. Does anyone know how many councils there have been in the history of our church? Twenty-one! In the history of the Catholic Church... There have been 21 times when the church did exactly what they did here in Acts 15, where all the bishops in the world, under the leadership of the Pope, defined matters of the faith. Does anyone know some of the key, some key components that have been defined over time by ecumenical councils? Let me give you a hint. We recite it every Sunday at Mass. The Nicene Creed. The Council of Nicaea in 325, they resolve the doctrine of the Trinity. It was a Catholic church, the Council of Nicaea. That's how we got our Nicene Creed. Remember, what are the four parts of the Nicene Creed? We believe in wow. one God. The second paragraph, we believe in Jesus Christ. The third paragraph, we believe in the Holy Spirit. There's the, do, there's the Trinity. And then the, the fourth paragraph, we believe in Holy one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. That's where we got that. The Council of Nicaea. So it formally defines something. Anything else? What about our understanding of the Eucharist? Remember there's a word about this long that describes what happens at Mass? Transubstantiation. Do you know when that came into being? Oh, Julie. 1215, <laughs> Fourth Lateran Council. That was another ecumenical council that formally defined our understanding of what happens at the, at the Eucharist. Do you know which ecumenical council addressed the Protestant Reformation? Trent. Trent. There was a council in Trent in 1545 that addressed some of the Protestant dissensions. So we have these councils. And really, do the math. If there have been 21 councils in 2,000 years, what's about the average? One every 100 years. One about every 100 years. So it's something that doesn't happen very frequently, but it happens over time to clarify error in the, you know, that, that's out there, to formally tell people this is what we really believe. 